plastics. That famous line from The Graduate, a 1967 feature film, where a young Dustin Hoffman is advised upon college graduation that the next big thing, the next gold rush, the best emerging career path is the plastics industry. Plastics. I meant with your future, your life. Well, that's a little hard to say. Ben. Excuse me. Mr. McGuire. Ben. Mr. McGuire. Come with me for a minute. I want to talk to you. Excuse us, Joanne. Of course. Yes. I just want to say one word to you. Just one word. Yes, sir. Are you listening? Yes, I am. Plastics. Exactly. How do you mean? There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? Yes, I will. Enough said. That's a deal. Here he is now. Here's they were touted as miracle products. Over many generations since the creation of celluloid from plant-based cellulose in the years 1856 to 1870 in England, which was principally used for film stock in the movies and as a substitute for the ever more expensive and always ecologically disastrous and cruel ivory trade, and Bakelite in 1907, the first synthetic thermoplastic, Chemists had perfected ways of turning hydrocarbons into moldable, stretchable, endlessly configurable, and almost immortably durable plastics. Materials so named because they were plastic, a word that is used to mean simply can change forms. Now think about it. There are many people today who fight against plastic because of the current chemical properties and disposal chain of oil-based polymers we call plastics, but the word actually refers to anything whose shape can change. It doesn't mean artificial, doesn't mean man-made or environmentally problematic. Plastics don't have to be made out of fossil fuels either. They were just the cheapest, most readily available, easy to monopolize, and versatile feedstock chemists could get their hands on to make their useful plastic materials. Oh, and by the way, plastic surgery, as you no doubt know, has almost nothing to do with plastics. It simply means a form of surgery that changes and reshapes the body. Now, sometimes the materials we now call plastics are used in plastic surgery, such as silicone implants for breast augmentation and plastic dentures or other prostheses, but that's not where the term comes from. And it is funny that describing somebody as plastic, you know, that, that girl, I can't stand her, she's so plastic, meaning artificial. It's a much more modern Barbie doll era use of the word. See, in Shakespeare's time, saying somebody was plastic meant they were moldable, variably a good or bad thing. Shakespeare did say there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Good or bad depending on who was doing the molding. A teacher might say, I like you, you're very plastic, and I feel I could be a good mentor to you given your plasticity. All that said, what is wrong with plastics? Some say they are a victim of their own success. Many were designed to be super durable, and that very longevity that makes them so useful makes them an aesthetic nightmare when they're in the wrong place, at the wrong time, in the wrong concentration, our definition of pollution. Dumped into our environments, many simply persist and persist and persist and persist, taking up space and creating an eyesore. But if their offensive aesthetics were the only problem, that would cause a crisis. It wouldn't be a cause for crisis levels of concern. Like when I was in Borneo, researching in a Dayak tribal village in the rainforest, it was my romantic notions of the pristine wilderness that were offended when I noted that the village streets, those wonderful unpaved dirt roads, were littered with candy wrappers. I complained to the chief, went right up to the chief of the village, and I said, this has got to stop. And he said to me with stern amusement, what harm are they doing? Are they not the same as the leaves and the flower petals also littered on the road? Are they not similarly bright with colors? Many here find them pretty. I persisted, but they aren't biodegradable. That means they'll last forever. 
the leaf litter, which I agree is a form of litter, yeah, leaf litter, turns into soil. But these just stay here. He smiled again. And when they get to be too many, what, do you think we let them bury us? No, we simply come out with brooms and sweep them up. Ah, but what do you do with them after you sweep them, I asked. Why, we burn them, of course. And then they vanish in a puff of smoke, he said triumphantly. I felt shock and dismay. But, 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 but burning plastic is toxic. It poisons the air, you know, dioxins, and it poisons your children, I exclaimed. Aha, he countered. So you agree we should instead just let them pile up on the road. I was stuck. Maybe bury them, I said tentatively. Or, 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 or don't, don't buy them at all. Ban them. The chief laughed at that. <laughs> and deprive people of their pleasure? No, there's nothing wrong with these colorful decorations scattered on the ground. It's just the way you Westerners see it. Now back then, in the early 1990s, I didn't have a good answer, so I simply remained haunted for years. Today I could actually talk about the difficulties of recycling candy wrappers, which are typically mixed materials, plastic and aluminum and paper laminated, and the hopeful new industry shift, spearheaded by Mars Candies Company, for example, toward using, quote, a food-grade polymer film compound called solanil, end quote, that is biodegradable, compostable, and uses only a third of the energy oil-based materials, what candy wrappers are typically made of, use. Now, many, many petroleum-based plastics could be replaced by biodegradable versions, particularly single-use plastics that don't need to last more than a few weeks to do their job, right? And there are now photocatalysts that will start degrading plastics on cue when left in the sun but which allow the plastic to sit on the shelf forever. And for plastics that don't and shouldn't biodegrade at all because their longevity is a necessary feature, there are many forms of recycling and reuse. My nine-year-old son is being trained by his video survival games in a whole new mentality about plastics. When he was nine last year, he discovered the role-playing game Raft. And since he lives in Germany with his mother, and I don't get to see him often, it became one of our chief ways of getting together online. The narrative for this survival game is that you must cooperate to build a raft from whatever flotsam and jetsam and junk you find floating in the ocean or lying around on island atolls that the wind blows you to by chance. The game takes place on a raft in a post-apocalyptic climate change induced sea level rise ravaged dystopia and you are adrift at sea on your raft. I've missed my One of the opportunity. activities my son and I engage in each time we play is Give it to fishing me. for plastics there you go. so that I we can use them great to build rainwater capture containers and solar stills yeah. to purify salt water and sails and windscreens and nice. rudders and all sorts of useful objects because plastic is yes. so... Yeah, dude. Plastic. Just so much plastic. It's one of the most sought after materials in the game. And for my first time, for the first time in my life, I find myself scanning the virtual horizon, looking out for the hopeful gleam of plastic in the dying rays of sunlight, bemoaning our fate when we end up in an area with clean seas, ironically, and hoping beyond hope that we blunder into the Pacific plastic gyro patch, which is, in the real world, now the size of Texas. What wonders we might build if we could find enough free-floating petroleum-based shapeable moldable materials but that is a fantasy game. And in the real world, upcycling plastic isn't so easy. For one thing, the degradation of plastic, biologically, out in nature, turns out to be a problem. It turns out that much of it does seem to go away eventually, but that doesn't mean it's rendered harmless. In fact, it can be much less harmless if it would simply stay in big, ugly chunks where it can serve as surface area for algae and microbes to colonize and form slimy films on. In fact, we use it for exactly that in our aquaponic systems and our biodigesters. And when it degrades, it may disappear from sight, but it turns out much of it is simply splitting into tinier and tinier plastic particles called microplastics that make them actually accumulate in the food chain. And since they're still the same kinds of plastics with the same chemistries, 
Many of them can exert much more toxic, toxic effects in the land, air, water, and food as they become ingested by other organisms. They bioaccumulate. And one of the most insidious forms of this kind of plastic toxicity was highlighted at National Geographic this summer at the launch of their Planet or Plastic campaign, where we explorers all took the pledge to eliminate single-use plastic from our lives as much as possible. One of the speakers, a wonderful plastics expert, a woman who is spending her life researching this, talked about how plastics in some marine debris can actually absorb significant amounts of methyl mercury. Hey, that rhymes. That could almost be a song. Meanwhile, the additives used to create some forms of plastic, arsenic and mercury and um, phthalates and others, and of course there's bisphenol A or BPA, quote, one of the many man-made chemicals classified as endocrine disruptors, which alter the function of the endocrine system by mimicking the role of the body's natural hormones, end quote. All of these are accumulating in our food chain. The last thing we should be doing is allowing plastic to end up in our oceans, not because it doesn't degrade, but because it does. Leaching the additives into the food web and becoming small enough to enter the body of organisms. Out of sight doesn't mean we can keep them out of mind. We can heave no sigh of relief when we discover the plastics have eventually fallen apart. And in fact, the industrial sleight of hand used with many so-called and improperly labeled biodegradable plastics is simply to put cornstarch or some other plant-based filler in the mix so the plastic appears to biodegrade when what it is really doing is just breaking up into tiny unbiodegradable pieces that simply no longer offend our aesthetic sense but now can do even worse biological damage. Now there are some microbes and even some insects like the tenebrio beetle larva, which you know as the mealworm, that have enzymes that can actually take the polymers and monomers apart and render them harmless as CO2 and nitrogen and H2O and sulfur, etc. But so far this is occurring mostly in controlled lab conditions and needs more research. For now, the trick with plastics is to keep them out of the biosphere and firmly in the technosphere as part of an endlessly transmutative industrial ecology. And doing this isn't so hard. There are, of course, cool plastic to oil machines. I have one in New York. And we hope soon to build the precious plastic shredders and melters and extruders and injection molders and 3D printers and other such machinery that can turn our plastic waste into value-added products once again. There are ways to recycle all plastics, and most of them are actually fairly simple if, and you all know the answer to this one, if you make sure the plastics are clean and separated by species so there aren't any mixed materials. Yes, the plastics should be separated into their own species, like bottle caps. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> which are ideal for 3D printing, being made out of polypropylene, which is what they use to make 3D uh, printing filament, which is normally very expensive, but these are free, so thanks guys. In fact, it is because bottle caps are made of polypropylene and the plastic bottles they're on are made out of PET or polyethylene terphthalate, which is a phthalate, which is that toxin we were talking about earlier in class, that cities like New York ask you to please remove the bottle caps and throw them away when you put the bottles in the recycling bin. Because PET and PP have a 100 degree difference in melting temperature, so it isn't profitable for cities to recycle bottles with the caps on. Somebody has to be paid to remove them. And so these end up getting thrown away. Whereas these are actually, for those of us who are doing this at home, are the most valuable, because I can't recycle PET at home but I can 3D print with this. Thank you. Thus, with plastics, it is almost always an issue of incompatible materials or mixed materials and contamination. Plastics need to be cleaned of organic residues, and they need to be separated by type of plastic, which usually means melting point characteristics. Now, all that said, it isn't actually hard to recycle plastics. The hardest thing actually turns out to be changing consumer behavior and incentives for cleaning and separating plastics. The Zabaline garbage pickers of Cairo have an incentive because that's how they make their living. But 
Most of us never think about it. And they ask us, please, if you only do one thing, separate the organic from the inorganic. And we'll take care of the rest. Clean all the inorganic so that there isn't any organic material on it. We'll separate the species of plastic. That's fine. So now, in this lecture and in this course, where we stubbornly refuse to allow the concept of waste as a noun to prevail, I don't want to convince you that plastics aren't a problem, but simply decrying them as the enemy of all that is sustainable, when they were designed to sustain in a certain sense, is counterproductive. I know this firsthand. I was part of an environmental music tour of India with the great solar-powered band Solar Punch whose formation I inspired a few years earlier doing my own solar-powered concerts in Egypt and Morocco with the U.S. Embassy as part of our nation's Changing Hearts and Minds program, started by Colin Powell with the Cultural Affairs Department of the U.S. Embassy. Say hello to Solar Punch, a band that practices what it preaches. Singing about energy conservation and renewable energy only on solar-powered instruments. The US-based band is currently touring India. We got that road and I got that solar power. And I'm on there and I'm on there, man, yeah. Their performance at the Vasan Valley School in Delhi had the students up on their feet applauding a very desi Bollywood number. <laughs> I really like the performance in total. I mean, I, I thought their message was very moving. It seems in my esteem that there is much more awareness in India of climate solutions as well as the environmental uh, issues that are facing both young and old today. And the students uh, do indeed seem keenly plugged in to the fact that something is going on. The concert has inspired me quite a bit and I'm sure it's inspired everyone who watched it today. Well, Solar Punch is certainly doing a lot to bring sunshine into energy conservation. Catch Solar Punch live at the start of NDTV's Yamuna Cleanathon, 6 p.m. on Saturday at the Kodesia Ghat in North Delhi. And when we got the gig to perform with the India Youth Climate Network, traveling around the subcontinent in Reva electric cars and biodiesel and photovoltaic support vehicles, doing concerts and workshops and environmental theater everywhere from Mumbai to New Delhi, I was delighted that one of our feature songs was called Plastic. It's getting very drastic. Yeah, plastic. It's getting very drastic. Sing along with me. By band leader, songwriter, documentary filmmaker, and animator, the great James Dean Conklin. painted plastic as a villain, and we would get kids to boo at plastic, ooh, ooh, because that's the kind of theater we were doing. And one of our crowning moments was playing the song on a huge stage floating on the Ganges River in front of thousands of people at a festival where single-use plastic was banned. Ooh, ooh, <laughs> ooh. This was in January of 2009, mind you, India being way ahead of the U.S. in environmental things. 
And at the end of the song, the organizers told the crowd that they could throw their drink cups. Thanks. They could throw their drink cups into the Ganges River because rather than being made out of plastic like we have, all of the drink cups in the festival were made out of Ganges River clay. Thus, throwing the disposable cup away just returned the clay to the river from which it was made. Brilliant. Ah, India. All that said, however, we couldn't deny that a significant portion of the vehicles and musical instruments and everything else we used to make the show was, of course, made of plastic. Even the LED lights and parts of the solar panels. But what we were really wanting to say by way of messaging was far more nuanced than can simply be expressed in a little song like, plastic, it's getting drastic. It is getting drastic, but there are appropriate uses for plastics, appropriate forms and chemistries for plastics to suit each situation. And there are appropriate ways of dealing with plastic materials at the end of its originally intended use life in the cradle to cradle scenario. The situation with plastic certainly may be drastic, but there's nothing inherently evil about plastic per se. What we need most right now, as I see it, is to put intense pressure on industry, not just to label all the species of plastic much better than they do right now, but to manufacture items that either have no mixed plastic and never mix with other materials, or which can be easily disassembled into plastic types ideally by the consumer, before placing in a designated and easier to understand recycling bin. Right now, many, but certainly not all plastics, have the little recycling symbol and the number designating which of the seven basic types of plastic they are. For review, there's one, polyethylene terephthalate, P-E-T-E or P-E-T. Number two, high density polyethylene or H-D-P-E. Number three, polyvinyl chloride, PVC. Number four, low density polyethylene, or LDPE. Number five, polypropylene, PP. Number six, polystyrene, or styrofoam, PS. And number seven, other. SAN, ABS, PC, nylon, that needs to be further distinguished. But the public doesn't really know what to do with these numbers and designations, and they're, they're very hard to separate. And the recycling collection bins are not anywhere near specific enough. So ultimately, we need to get to a different place. And this is what my wife and I are doing in our lives. We see plastic as so valuable that we're unwilling to throw any of it out. We consider it ours. And so we have separate bins at home for every kind of wasted material we bring home. We pay for it. We're going to keep it, clean it, and keep it until we have enough to do something of upcycling value with it or sell it. It's business. And we encourage everybody to take on that kind of radical adult responsibility. You paid for it, you brought it home, you keep it. Shut up or put up. As for us, the future feels bright because the future is plastics. <laughs>